Hidden in plain sight, air pollution is a silent assassin on a global rampage. Today we're going to take an eye-opening journey into the shadowy world of this environmental hazard that we often overlook. We're going to unveil the staggering impacts of air pollution on health, the ecosystem, and economies of the world. Effects far more devastating than commonly acknowledged, resulting in lung cancer, kidney damage, infertility, and a whole lot more. From the smog-choked streets of bustling cities to the invisible toxins in rural areas, we're going to reveal just how this insidious threat is not just a vague environmental issue, but it really is a pressing health crisis. Now, one of the biggest myths about air pollution is that it only really affects those living in large, densely populated cities. After all, nearly everyone has seen a news segment showing an orange haze covering Beijing or air quality warnings for Los Angeles. But this doesn't tell the full story. Horrifyingly, data from the World Health Organization shows that 99% of people on Earth are currently breathing air with some level of contaminants, and 9 out of 10 people are breathing dangerous levels. Obviously, air in some places is much safer to breathe than others, but essentially, no one is completely safe, as these pollutants have by now spread around the entire globe. The source of all this pollution varies depending on your location, but the main contributors are vehicles, power generation, residential heating, waste incineration, and general industry. However, this only accounts for ambient or outdoor pollution. Household air pollution is the other half, which occurs when people use things like open fires to cook without proper ventilation in their home. Now, this isn't something that affects very many people in Europe and North America, but it is quite literally strangling Africa, where many people rely on burning kerosene or biomass to cook their food, releasing dangerous levels of pollutants into their homes. But even if you were to cook in a remote area, cook your food safely outdoors, and refuse to use any sort of vehicle, you still aren't going to be able to escape the danger. The thing is, pollutants don't just rise into the atmosphere and then disappear. Oftentimes, they will react with other elements and become what are known as secondary pollutants, which can linger in the air for months, carried around by wind currents before coming back down to Earth in a completely different location. For example, ozone pollution, or O3, is carried across the Pacific by natural air currents originating in China and often ending up on the US West Coast, raising the ozone pollution levels there by nearly 48%. Singapore suffers from smoke produced in Indonesian fires, and the whole of South America suffers from slash and burn clearing of the Amazon. Now, before we can understand how this contaminated air affects human health, we first need to understand what exactly we mean when we say pollution. For starters, pollutants can be a gas such as carbon monoxide and methane, but they can also take the form of small particles, often called particulate matter, which can be tiny bits of metal, dirt, or liquid droplets that are so light that they're carried around by air currents and can stay floating around in the atmosphere for weeks or even months. Generally, it's high concentrations of these particles that scatter sunlight, creating the smoggy haze that we're all familiar with. So what happens to our body when we inhale these? Well, first up today, we have sulfur dioxide, a gas formed during the burning of coal and the smelting of several metals. This is one of the most common gaseous pollutants, and it is downright terrible for your body. Apart from being an irritant to your skin and mucous membranes, it's also been shown to worsen lung function and put those with heart disease at a higher risk of an attack, even at moderate levels. Along with other gases, it can also cause eye irritation, shortness of breath, and even dizziness. However, in many cases, particulate matter is even more dangerous. The real problem is that these particles are incredibly tiny. In fact, for the largest type, we're talking just 10 micrometers in diameter. That, for reference, is about the thickness of a spider web. These particles can penetrate the deepest parts of your lungs and settle in your bronchi. Particles smaller than 10 micrometers can make it even further, passing through the gas exchange and entering the bloodstream. The very smallest bits of particulate matter are called nanoparticles, and they are so small that they can even pass through cell membranes, allowing them to easily migrate into various organs throughout their journey in your circulatory system, meaning they can end up in your kidneys, your heart, even your brain. What's shocking is that these nanoparticles, generally referred to as PM2.5, are very common, as one type of them is a common byproduct of combustion in diesel engines that is released from a car's exhaust onto busy streets. Not only are these nanoparticles harmful on their own, but they can also carry various other harmful substances that have latched onto them, and making them even more dangerous. Airborne particulates are classified as a Group 1 carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, putting it in the same category of likely cancer-causing substances as asbestos and plutonium. 
A 2013 study found that of the 312,000 subjects examined from nine European countries, every single one had been breathing higher than the recommended quantities of particulate matter, and that for every increase of 10 micrograms per cubic meter in a given area, the corresponding lung cancer rate increased by 22%. Another critical pollutant commonly found in smog is lead. Now, we know for decades that lead is highly toxic to humans, which is why it was removed from paint and gasoline in the 20th century. However, it is still produced and released into the air during metal processing. Also, while lead was definitely taken out of the gas that cars use, it was not removed from aviation fuel for small piston aircraft, of which there are more than 200,000 in the US alone. This is why people that live in close proximity to small airports have, on average, 21% higher blood lead levels than people who don't. Children are at the highest risk of complications due to lead ingestion, which can include developmental and cognitive issues. In fact, a 2022 study found that because many American adults were exposed to higher levels of lead in their childhood, a collective 824 million IQ points were lost from the country solely due to this one element. But vague health hazards, and supposed slight IQ drops aside, here is the sobering reality. As a direct result of the increased risk associated with air pollution, an estimated 8.3 million people died prematurely in 2023 around the world, with the majority of those coming from pollution-related lung cancer, heart disease, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. This is an increase of almost a million in the last few years, and it also means that poor air quality is a higher indicator for death than obesity, and is only beaten as a risk factor by smoking and high blood pressure. About 5 million of these deaths are the result of outdoor pollution, while the rest are from indoor pollution, with the most affected regions in the world again being Africa and South Asia. Many nations in Africa suffer heavily from indoor pollution as a result of using unsafe fuels in their stoves. Commonly used fuels include wood, kerosene, and animal waste, which without proper ventilation quickly fill the air near the stove with harmful particles. The demographic most at risk of complications from indoor pollution in Africa are women, as they spend, on average, much more time than men standing close to their stoves. In South Asia, the biggest problem is outdoor pollution, coming from a variety of sources. Big cities in India and Pakistan, for example, have some of the worst air quality in the world, with the culprits largely being unregulated industrial emissions, vehicle exhaust, and large-scale waste burning. Another major contributor is construction dust, which in some Indian cities is estimated to account for half of the pollution. This region, in general, struggles with some of the worst air quality on Earth. The first and second most polluted cities in the entire world are both in Pakistan, Lahore and Karachi, which are the only two cities on Earth to be ranked as very unhealthy on the US Air Quality Index, which ranks cities in six categories from healthy to hazardous. These two cities are the only ones in the very unhealthy category, uh, that's number five, but there are about 20 more cities around the world in category four. Hotspots for intense hazardous air quality include industrial cities in Poland, Dubai, New Delhi, Mexico, and basically every other major city in China, with the worst being Beijing. It really cannot be overstated just how many people are potentially being put at risk on a daily basis just from breathing outside. If you're one of the 16 million people that live in Chengdu, China, for example, you're being exposed to particulate matter more than 15 times the safe limit, while in Krakow, Poland, it's even higher at 21 times the WHO guidelines. And Karachi, Pakistan, ranks in with a staggering PM 2.5 content 37 times higher than the limit, putting everyone at an incredibly high risk of health issues. Now, as we said earlier, one of the main issues with air pollution is that it doesn't stay with its source. It spreads, and it spreads far. David Edwards, director at the National Center for Atmospheric Research Earth System Laboratory, even noted that, quote, pollution emitted from one source region can find its way around the globe more than once. He says that because of this, there's basically nowhere left on the planet that's completely free from the pollutants that we're pumping into the atmosphere. Even Antarctica is being affected, with more and more concentrations of black carbon or soot being identified in its snow and ice. And so, with pollutants essentially covering the globe, there are bound to be consequences for the planet. Not only do humans suffer harm, but so do, do plants, as pollutants that come down and mess with the soil content affect how well plants can function. This is especially true of heavy metals, which affect the efficiency of root systems. Others, like O3, damage the metabolic function of leaves, inhibiting photosynthesis and making the plant less likely to survive. One of the most damaging of plants, though, is acid rain, which occurs when sulfur dioxide rises into the atmosphere, interacts with water, and comes back down in the form of water, with a pH level lower than normal. Despite the scary name, acid rain isn't strong enough to melt skin or cause any instant damage like you might think, but prolonged exposure causes major problems, especially for soil quality. 
For the most shocking example of how devastating acid rain can be, look no further than Norilsk in Russia, a city that began growing after World War II when huge deposits of nickel, copper, and coal were discovered in the area. The pollution here is so extreme that residents report that on bad days you can taste metal in the air. And even if you close all your windows, the scent still drifts into your house. The air here is 25 times more polluted than the air in Moscow, and its main pollutant is sulfur dioxide, created as a result of all the smelting in the city, nearly all of which is under the control of a single company known as Norosk Nickel. Researchers have found that no other enterprise in the whole world creates as much sulfur dioxide pollution as this company, with the only rivaling source being large volcanic eruptions. This sulfur dioxide and ensuing acid rain has all but annihilated the ecosystem that once surrounded the city. Instead of the lush, dense forests that once filled the landscape, residents of Norilsk are now encircled by a dead zone so large that it is visible from space, a radius of 30 miles where nothing can grow, accompanied by 5.9 million acres of dead and dying forest downwind from the factories, a barren, inhospitable scar on the face of the earth larger than the entire country of Slovenia. And this only scratches the surface of the environmental horrors that have taken place in the city, which also include numerous diesel fuel spills and the river literally turning red, and a whole lot more. It's no wonder that life expectancy here is 10 years less than the average Russian, despite reportedly having access to higher quality healthcare. Another place on Earth with shocking environmental damage from air pollution is the Indian Ocean, where a recurring monster known as the Asian Brown Cloud appears between October and February of each year. This huge cloud forms during the winter months, when there's far less rain to clear out the air, and so the pollution ends up hanging over the region for months like a big atmospheric stain. Throughout these months, it weakens Indian rainfall and contributes to droughts in northern China. It also increases rainfall in northern Australia and accelerates the melting of glaciers in the Hindu Kush and Himalayas. The amount of O3 present in the cloud affects food production, lowering crop yields, and according to recent research, the cloud's disruption of wind currents may be intensifying cyclones in the Arabian Sea. The longer it goes on, the more natural weather patterns it will continue to disrupt, putting well over a billion people at risk underneath it. What's often overlooked about air pollution is the fact that it also affects water sources, even remote ones. A 2014 study found that fish in Olympic National Park in the U.S. state of Washington had some of the highest mercury levels in the country, despite living in a fairly pristine nature reserve filled with mountains, trees, and absolutely no factories. The mercury content was so high that many of the fish were deemed outright unsafe for human consumption and are affecting the reproductive potential of birds that eat them. As for how mercury got to such a remote place, well, it traveled through the air. Mercury content in the atmosphere has tripled over the last hundred years, with the biggest source being coal-fired power plants. And finally, a concerning consequence of air pollution is its impact on global warming. That black carbon in Antarctica that we mentioned earlier, it mixes with snow, and it traps heat from the sun, accelerating the melting of the polar ice caps. It's such an effective heat trapper that while it's in the air, that it's estimated to be a thousand times more effective than the most common greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide. The damage air quality is doing to the ice caps is most visible during the Arctic haze, which is when a haze with the reddish hue lingers for over a month near the North Pole. It can be so thick that it severely reduces the visibility for pilots, and the heat trapping it causes leads scientists to believe that the Arctic summer sea ice may be completely eliminated by 2040. And all this despite being incredibly far away from the actual sources of the pollution. Now, knowing that air pollution kills millions of people every year, harms crops and plant life, and is contributing to climate change, obviously, it's a problem that everybody wants to address. But finding a solution is far easier said than done. For starters, curbing the source of air pollution is not a priority for many people who rely on such processes to make a living and don't have an immediate alternative. A great example of this is the handling of electronic waste. Nearly 70% of the world's e-waste ends up in China, and as much as 80% of this is processed in unregulated, unsupervised conditions. Giyu, the city with the most e-waste handling on Earth, relies on the imports of electronic trash for their economy as they strip down old monitors, phones, and computers for valuable metals that they can then sell. Anything that can't be sold is then incinerated, filling the city with the scent of burning plastic. People living in Giyu have the highest blood lead levels in the world as a result. It's easy for Western nations to criticize places like Gaiyu for handling waste like that. But the waste wouldn't be there in the first place if countries like the US and Europe didn't keep shipping it to them year after year instead of taking care of the waste themselves. It's essentially outsourced pollution. Another big roadblock 
is the use of combustion engines. There are an estimated 1.5 billion cars on Earth today, a major polluter, especially in big cities. While in an ideal world we'd phase these out for less polluting options, they are far too central in the lives of millions to just disappear or be replaced overnight. It's a process that's going to take decades or more to tackle, which means decades of continued exposure to harmful pollutants. And even if we were to fix all of these issues, we still face the fact that many of the pollutants in the air are there as a result of industrial processes that keep society functioning, like metal smelting. If we wanted to eliminate these entirely, we'd have to find new cost-effective ways of filtering the contaminants out of the air, which is not something that's going to happen overnight. Even if we do develop new methods, it will take years to implement them globally as it's of a low priority to many people, such as cobalt manufacturers in the Democratic Republic of the Congo who don't have the spare time and resources to bother installing new technology while they're barely scraping by as it is. Overall, it doesn't seem likely that this problem will be addressed in the near future, which leaves millions continuing to die at the hands of hazardous smoke and billions more at health risks from particulate matter at every single one of us is inhaling microscopic consequences of what we've pushed into the air all around us.